Good morning. Well, it's morning here in Northern California. I'm Michael Krasny. I want to welcome you to another live episode of Gray Matter with Michael Krasny, a global podcast where each week we do a deep dive interview with national and international experts, authors, journalists, artists, entertainers, and opinion shapers. And we include your questions and comments. And we cordially invite those of you who have not yet joined this podcast to become members. We cover a wide range of intellectually stimulating and engaging topics and issues distinguished by high-level content and technical excellence. And to become a member of this podcast, simply go to graymatter.show, and that's gray with an E. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Robert Pearl, who served for 18 years as the CEO of this nation's largest medical group, Kaiser Permanente, responsible for the medical care of some 5 million patients across the United States, a Yale MD who is named one of the modern healthcare's 50 most influential physician leaders. Dr. Pearl is the author of two best-selling books on healthcare, Mistreated and Uncaring are the titles. And he's also a clinical professor in the Stanford School of Medicine and a member of the faculty in Stanford School of Business. And he hosts two podcasts, Fixing Healthcare and Medicine the Truth. The next month, his book, ChatGPT MD, will be out, co-authored with Generative AI. The book concentrates on how AI-empowered patients and doctors can take back control of American medicine. And we're going to discuss Dr. Pearl's forthcoming book with him and much more. Let's see, I hope to get to much more, but as some of you know who listen to us regularly, we've done programs on AI, and I've said I wanted to cover sort of the visionary and the futuristic, and that's exactly what Dr. Pearl does in this book. And your questions and comments, again, are welcome, and I want to welcome Dr. Robert Pearl. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. The pleasure is all ours. Let's begin by just talking about how bullish you are, to put it mildly, on ChatGPT and on AI. And in fact, your book pretty much spells out how it's going to revolutionize not only patient care and medicine, but health care. And you get into specifics, and that's what I want to do with you. Before, actually, we broach that, I wanted to say something about, uh, we've known each other for a number of years, and friendship, and uh, I learned things about you that I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know, for example, that you were studying to be a cardiac surgeon. And there's a fascinating story behind that with Norman Shumway, no less. And you wound up, we're going to get into all the stuff in your new book here, but I just found this so interesting. You wound up going to Mexico and seeing some cleft palate operations, and that kind of changed your whole trajectory of your life, took you into plastic surgery. That's, that's correct. Uh, before I mention that, I should uh, point out for listeners and viewers that all the profits from my book are to Doctors Without Borders. I'm very committed to global surgery. And uh, by the way, for all three books, they go to Doctors Without Borders. And anyone who actually purchases it on the first day it's available, which is going to be April the 9th, we're going to make an extra donation to the 501c3 charity. So uh, please do so. It's a great cause to support. In terms of my trajectory, yes, I loved heart surgery. I trained at Yale in medical school, came to Stanford for my residency. And I still think the operations are fabulous. But uh, as a... Uh, Resident, you go rotating in different services, and I was on plastic surgery, went down to Mexico with uh, Don Lab, who was the chairman of the department at the time, and I watched him repair a child, came in with a cleft lip, a wide cleft lip, clearly would never have had a normal life, could never have, would have been teased in school and bullied and probably had trouble finding a job, could never have found a wife, and uh, lo and behold, in an hour and a half, the life changes and the mom's tears flow and... My heart was moved, and I decided that this was good, my calling. And uh, I continued to do so. Uh, in January, I went to the Philippines on a, another mission trip and repaired uh, 16 kids with cleft lip and cleft palate. And it hasn't changed. And all the time I've been doing it, it's still so fulfilling and mission and purpose and something missing from American medicine today, Michael. Yeah, I read your writings about that, too, and was impressed with what you had to say about doctors in the Philippines, for example, being as committed and as noble in the profession as doctors here. In fact, in many ways, perhaps they don't have some of the impediments that we have here, which actually ChatGPT may make a difference in. Why ChatGPT, though? Uh, I, I mean, uh, there are those who would say, you know, Google has a pretty good uh, operation going, uh, and Bard might be able to answer questions better. Your preference? Well, a couple of things first for listeners. You know, we use the word AI, and I, AI is such a general word. You can trace it back 40 years ago to uh, what's called rule-based AI, where humans would put in the rules, the computers would follow. Then when neural networks came along around the turn of the century, uh, we went to narrow AI, where you take, uh, say, 
10,000 mammograms, half that showed cancer, half that didn't. And the machine would come up with the rules to compare them. And today is actually better than humans. But both of those are very different than generative AI that you mentioned earlier in your, in your introduction. And I use ChatGPT because it fit well with MD. Uh, it also was the tool that I used and the co-author at the time because, as you say, the Ge Gemini release is only coming out around now. Uh, but the all, all the generative AIs are similar. You take a massive amount of information, everything on the internet, textbook, journal articles. Uh, in the future, you'll have audio exports from conferences. And then the application applying with now billions of rules about how you value one set of data over another. In medicine, we value more recent information over past information. We value from peer-reviewed journals over non-peer-reviewed journals. We value journals with high what's called impact factor. And all these rules that allow the large language model to present the information it's just that right now, OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT is far ahead of everyone else and moving forward very rapidly. Um, to me, two big advances that happened was uh, what's called the plugins and memory. When I was writing this book and decided to write it last fall, I realized that I couldn't take the two years of the normal writing cycle to complete it. And I put in the 1.2 million words that I've published across time taught it how I think, taught it how I learn, uh, taught the kinds of language I use, the word structure, uh, sitting within it. But that was a very laborious process to put all that information inside of it. And then from time I would go from one application to the next, it wouldn't be able to remember it. Now it can do those things. And that's why I'm so bullish, Michael, about uh, ChatGPT or generative AI. It's how fast it's moving. It's an exponential change. It doubles every year, which means by five years from now, it's going to be 30 times more powerful. 10 years, a thousand times more powerful. The human mind has such difficulty understanding exponential growth. To me, I was shocked last fall when everyone was looking at, oh, the mistakes that it's making and the shortcomings that it has. They were looking in the rearview mirror and couldn't see the future. I see the future as, as you say, transforming and revolutionizing American healthcare. Well, in fact, you go into specifics. Uh, I want to talk about some of the concerns, but the specifics are pretty impressive. And uh, let's talk about what we're actually quantifying here. Uh, safer hospitals, uh, uh, more accurate diagnoses, fewer misdiagnoses, fewer complications from chronic disease. I mean, the list just goes on, and it's an impressive list, and it's a list that really, I think, will revolutionize medicine. Uh, we won't, for now, not talk about the apprehensions or the fears and so forth, but maybe is it, is it changing so fast? One of the members of our team thought your book's going to be out in April. It may be changing even by the time your book comes out. It's changing all the time. This memory function was released by OpenAI last month, and who knows what's going to be here two months from now. That's the nature of exponential growth. You know, there's, uh, you may remember back in the COVID pandemic, we would talk about exponential growth because that's how viruses reproduce that if a pond in f takes 50 days to become fully covered with water lilies and the water lily plants reproduce once each night, and I ask you at f day 49, what percentage of the pond is covered? The answer is 50% only. Half of the pond is still not covered. Only 25% is covered two days in advance, 12% three days in advance. That's the nature of exponential growth. And so we're in that time frame right now, and you're right, it may change, but I don't know how to write a book in any shorter than six months. This was a real work of effort, but ChatGPT was very helpful and it impacts on the publishing industry. This was not written by ChatGPT. There, there was about one and a half chapters that ChatGPT wrote, and I indicate that in the book very clearly, what ChatGPT wrote alone. And there's probably another six or seven that I wrote by myself, but most of them, two thirds of the chapters were co-written back and forth the way you'd write with a human being. And it was really stimulating to see the improvements that ChatGPT would make, the changes that I would suggest. And in the end, I have to say, I was still the senior author, so I had the ultimate decision rights. But uh, we came very close to uh, coordinates of uh, viewpoint. And uh, your voice was at least similar enough uh, so that we can not necessarily get confused? Oh, yeah. I, uh, well, in, in terms of similar enough, I think in the end, a lot of it is my voice. The chapter is. I left the ones by ChatGPT specifically so you can see the difference in voice because ChatGPT is still not, again, a human. But if it's 10% of the way there, 
then it'll be 20%, then 40, then 80. So it's not a long pathway. It's two doublings until it reaches the endpoint that we might expect. Uh, it's more rigid. It's a bit more repetitious. It doesn't do quite as well at verb forms. But these, as I say, are minor problems, and they will get re resolved as this large language model continues to improve. I think there may be some more than minor problems in terms of what may be the results and consequences of uh, things moving toward generative AI. But I want to hold off on that because, as I say, there's a lot of really positive stuff. And some of that has to do with what you envision. It's a trajectory, really, that leads you to the assumption there's going to be much more hands-on patient care, which people don't associate usually with technology. Um, there's, in other words, there's going to be much more guided and, and intimate patient care, as you see it, uh, much less burnout for physicians, and much less of a corporate role, which is something that a lot of people are going to be very pleased by, at least in terms of your crystal ball. You're not going to be seeing Amazon and uh, CVS playing the kind of roles that they seem to be almost inevitably playing. It's going to be much more patient-centric, in other words, to begin with, and much more enhancing to the role that physicians can play and much less contributing to burnout in physicians, as you point out. Well, that depends. And it depends upon whether the clinicians take the lead or not. That's why I wrote the book. I mean, I write my books. Uh, none of them are, as I say, all the profits go to a charity, uh, Doctors Without Borders. I write them for education. I teach at Stanford Business and Medical School for education. I've been really an educator throughout much of my life. And I wanted people to understand what was possible, and in particular clinicians, to be willing to go ahead. Will they trust patients? Will they be willing to empower patients? Will they be able to see patients as being powerful members of the care delivery team? Because this is not sitting intrinsic in the culture of medicine. My last book on caring was about this culture of medicine. And doctors have had a very different role vis-a-vis -vis patients for a long time. So it depends. I'm hoping clinicians will lead the way. If not, as you mentioned, the retail giants, the Amazon, CVS, and Walmart, probably will take the lead. Uh, it will happen. That's the thing that everyone needs to understand. Technology of this nature happens. It's like social media. We can debate whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but it's going to happen once that potentiality exists. But as you say, the big opportunities, chronic disease is a great example. 60% of Americans have chronic disease. It's a leading cause of uh, mortality. It's a leading cause of cost. Probably 70% of uh, deaths and 70% of costs can be attributed to chronic diseases. And we do a poor job as clinicians across the United States. Hypertension, number one cause of strokes, major contributor to kidney failure and heart failure. We control it about 55 to 60% of the time. We could control it 90% easily. We just don't do it. Now, why don't we do it? We have very dedicated physicians. They care a lot. The last thing they would want is to harm a patient. And patients don't want to be harmed. The problem is that we have an antiquated, antiquated system of care. And what I mean by that is it was left over from the last century with the problems that doctors took care of were what's called acute problems. You broke your bone, you had appendicitis, you developed pneumonia, and the treatment was done and then the problem almost always was resolved. With a chronic disease, you have it during the rest of your life and you don't treat it once a year, you treat it three or four times a year. And we have a system that's dependent upon acute illness for chronic disease. But we have now the technology that's possible to change that. We can use monitors at home attached to the generative AI technology, the chat GPT, that will tell you how you're doing to suggest when change needs to happen, not three, four months from now when your return visit to the doctor is, but in the interim. And clinicians can use that information and make the medication decisions. And with these plugins that I mentioned earlier, its ability to easily upload information into the application, you actually can put in the doctor's recommendations. So the expected course of improvement and the uh, barriers that should say, now you're so far outside of the range we expect, I'd like to know about it. Right now, what do we have? We have technology that dumps information into doctors' offices, into their computer systems. They don't have the bandwidth for it. They don't have the time for it. And the burnout we see exists. And then, as you mentioned earlier, the corporatization. You have insurers now who are pushing back at the fact that the diseases are costing more and more. What's the solution? Keep people healthy. 
avoid the diseases. Better control them so that you don't get the complications, the heart attacks, the strokes, the kidney failure. Preventive medicine. Yeah, preventive medicine is a piece of it, but better medicine. Fewer misdiagnoses, fewer medical errors, better control. Get your blood pressure controlled. More than half of Americans with type 2 diabetes do not have good control. Invariably, you're going to get complications. How do we solve that problem? The current system of medicine is not capable of doing it. Doctors would have to work, it's estimated, 27 hours a day to do all the things that are necessary to take care of the current size of a what's called a medical panel, the number of patients a doctor takes care of. It's just not possible, and we continue to ignore it. And this book is hopefully will change it. It's not sustainable in terms of economics either. I mean, you know, all the projections are, especially as the deficit continues to increase, projections are trillions by just a few decades ahead of us. But I'm wondering about how much of this is contingent on the next generation of professionals and how they need to be prepared, the education side of it that you mentioned. Well, absolutely. We need to be training the next generation totally differently. You know, right now we select doctors on the criteria of the last century, which is your memory. And you needed that in the last century because you'd have to carry around a 50 pound backpack filled with books in order to be able to have all the information at your fingertips. <clears throat> now you carry it in your pocket. It's sitting in your iPhone. And if you have an iPhone with uh, GPT-4, you can get that information in a matter of seconds for almost every problem. We need to train the next generation totally differently based upon how they can use generative AI, both for their own care practice and for empowering patients. It's interesting, Michael, since I, wrote the, since I started writing about the book, uh, telling people about the April 9th publication date, I've heard from quite a number of physicians who are already using it. And they, they made it, they haven't read the book, obviously, because it's not out, but they made it sound as though, Rob, you don't realize how much it can do, how many diagnoses it can make. It's making diagnoses for me that I would not have made. It's making it for my patients, and that's the current generation of it. And again, I want to caution listeners, I am not recommending that they rely on the current version for their healthcare. They still need a healthcare professional to oversee it. But I'm also letting everyone know that if you wait five years, that calculus will have changed in a very positive way for both patients and physicians. Well, I really like and welcome your bullishness and optimism. Uh, it's a very sanguine view and it's one that's uh, very comfortable to hear. So let me talk about some of the concerns because the concerns are manifold and particularly with things like, uh, is ChatGPT HIPAA compliant? I mean, just for openers, but also concerns about... Um, uh, risks of it being overly dependent upon, which we were kind of intimating before uh, to some degree. Or, uh, and, and there's all those data breaches, but also privacy, I mean, and security and ensuring privacy and security. I mean, these are things that we really have to tackle. And there's a lot of fear of new technologies, too. A lot of people, until the paradigm is in place, uh, are very apprehensive about it. Well, you're raising multiple excellent points. I want to address the last one first and then go back to the first few. You're absolutely right. We tend to fear technology, new technology, when it was first introduced. You can think back to when the first ATMs came around. People were concerned they would eat their money, it would make mistakes. And probably initially there might have been a couple that had to be corrected. But now, you know, we put checks into our banking account. We do major financial transactions all using that same technology. I think that what you need to do when you're looking at privacy and security and we should talk about bias in some detail a little later on because it's slightly different. But in terms of privacy and security, you have to compare it to what otherwise exists. If you're using Google and you're clicking on links, you're putting your privacy and security at major exposure. The question is, if instead of clicking on those links, you go and you go into a generative AI application, will you make that more or less? In terms of security, there's no reason why OpenAI with the you know, huge number of billions of dollars it has shouldn't be as good as these other companies that are protecting it. It has the technological ability to do so. I can't tell you that it is or not because I haven't read a study on it, but there's no reason to believe that it would be any different than what currently exists. And we've certainly seen, I think, over 100 million data breaches this year into the electronic healthcare record system. So it's not to say that it's... Uh, flawless or risk-free, 
but is no different than what exists today. It doesn't make anything worse. In terms of privacy, it's probably better. I mean, remember, most of these other places make their money on advertising. And if you're advertising, then you're going to be selling data. OpenAI, at least so far, isn't doing that. It's a subscription model for GPT-4, at least. And that means that the likelihood is it's going to be less. So I don't want to minimize the issues, the concerns. We need to address them, but we need to address them across the entire industry. I don't know if you read or your listeners and viewers read about this change health that happened where these um, um, ransomware hijackers got into the system and shut it down and basically brought American healthcare's FIFA service system to its knees. That is a risk that exists. And ChatGPT will not be any different. But as I say, if anything, it will be less dangerous, not more. Lots more to talk about. We're talking to Dr. Robert Pearl. And let me go first to some questions that are coming in here. This is Cynthia in San Diego. It says, as we look at the amount of health data we are collecting with devices like watches, how will AI analyze this data and provide predictive measures that could save lives? Will we start to see signs of something like a stroke or heart attack months or even years ahead of time? Absolutely, Cynthia, for two reasons. Number one, because right now, as uh, you point out, whether it's on a watch or it's we call a wearable device or even on a home device, if you're on a blood pressure cuff or a, uh, a scale in your bathroom or a, blue, a blood glucose monitor, uh, that data just either sits there or that data goes to a doctor's office that can't do much with it. ChatGPT, generative AI, can take that data, can analyze that data, and as you point out, can see things before clinicians otherwise would. Giving it 10,000 pieces of information is child's play for a uh, large uh, language model on a computer application. So it can look at those pieces, it can see the changes that are happening, and can point out when change should happen in terms of medication, when you're doing just fine. And by the way, there's no need to see the physician if everything's going well with the management of your chronic disease and the opportunity to warn you in advance some problem is happening. We see this a lot in patients with heart attacks and strokes. They delay care. And we now have an application that will allow them to put their symptoms in it and warn them that something is happening. Get to the ER as soon as possible. Call 911. So yes, this is a, a, a major opportunity. And I'll add one more piece, which is that it, it's, it's what's called a predictive analytic. It looks to the future, takes what information it has now and looks to the future to tell you what's about to happen, which means that it will learn how to predict that future. And right now as clinicians, we don't have that expertise. It will be able to do it better than we are, can accomplish today. Not the current version again, but one or two versions from now, somewhere three to five years in the future. And let me thank uh, Cynthia for the question and thank Reed for this question. Reed wants to know, thank you for your support of Doctors Without Borders, he begins, which I also support. However, the borders between our states is making important critical health care unavailable to millions of our citizens. I'm interested in your thoughts. I, I, Reed is absolutely right that the current political climate of the United States is getting in the way of excellent health care. Uh, the courts are involved in this. Congress is involved in all of this. State legislatures are involved in all of this. You know, and particularly if you go back, reproductive rights. I mean, let's absolutely. call it what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I was in college, I wanted to be a university professor. And I went uh, to study there. And my, in my freshman year, the individual who was my total hero went on to become the chairman at Reed College. Um, didn't get tenure because of his political views. And I said, I can't stand this. I want to go to something with no politics, healthcare, because that's life and death. How could there be politics in medicine? Boy, was I uh, <laughs> naive as a 17 year old. Yeah, there's a, unfortunately too many, as you point out and have pointed out throughout your illustrious career, too much politics when it comes to medicine, which actually brings up an interesting kind of question in my mind. I want to go back to ChatGPT and all that you're looking at predictively and futuristically, and it's fascinating. but. All your years at Kaiser, I mean, some people say Kaiser is a great model, like they use Canadian medicine as a great model, or they think Kaiser is a kind of socialized medicine, which it's not, of course. But the idea of Kaiser somehow, well, being transplanted, <laughs> to use a rather appropriate verb here, to the medical care system in general, uh, possibilities politically just aren't there in our present system, are they? 
as you point out, the Kaiser Permanente model is one that I have a major belief in. When I became the CEO in Kaiser Permanente, uh, we, were, we were good, we weren't great, and we made a focus on how we could use technology to become great. At that time, what we had is electronic health record before almost anyone else did, and we had a integrated medical group that had excellent collaboration, coordination. And we became number one according to the National Committee for Quality Assurance with 30 to 50% lower heart attack rates, 30 to 50% fewer deaths from cancer, uh, all these very important measures of quality. You also, and forgive we were, me, yeah. did things with respect to record keeping that were unprecedented. That was on your watch, by the way. I want to give you credit yeah. for that because it's almost a sterling example for many nationally. I don't have to stroke you, but that's really generally accepted all over. Well, that's why we, I mentioned earlier hypertension control 55 to 60% of the time. We control it 90% by having, the, as you say, the electronic health record available everywhere and having the collaboration and coordination across uh, people who were there. So, yes, so, so that's sitting in place. But the other big part that we had was the payment scheme. And this is, if, if anything, this is what I see to be the biggest challenge that generative AI is going to, to have. Because right now, 95% of American physicians are reimbursed through fee-for-service. The more you do, the more you get paid. If it adds any value or not, is irrelevant. In fact, you can get paid twice. If you do a procedure, you get a complication, they have to fix that complication. That's a absurd system. You know, Charlie Munger, um, the uh, recently deceased uh, leader of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, along with uh, Buffett, uh, t said, tell me your incentives and I'll tell you the outcomes you're going to get. A FIFA service system will always lead to more and more cost. And I think that that's the challenge that American medicine has exacerbated, as we said, by chronic disease. And it's why I'm optimistic that generative AI assuming that clinicians re uh, join together and start demanding to get paid on a prepaid prospective system where they get rewarded more for higher value for keeping people healthy. They make more money when patients don't get a heart attack, which is what you exactly you want as a patient. And so those opportunities are there. I think Kaiser Permanente, I'm hoping, will grab onto this and use it to push it even more rapidly ahead. But for the rest of the nation, this is the opportunity. And you mentioned earlier about the fact of burnout, that uh, clinicians are getting burnout right now because they just can't keep up with the demand. The demand is growing. It's like the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice when in the Mickey Mouse cartoon, when he, t he figures out how he can get a broom to reproduce, again, exponentially, interestingly enough, and to do some of the work and then he can't control it. Uh, the demand is just too great right now. And if you try to meet that by just providing more and more services, your costs get out of hand. This is where I think this return to a focus on health, not just disease treatment, and the ability of technology to allow that to happen without consuming all of the physician's time. To me, that's a invitation we shouldn't be saying no to, and I'm hoping that we won't. But that to me is the big threat, Michael, because if the clinicians don't lead that way, someone else will. Well, the costs are already out of hand. In fact, I was reading in your medical newsletter about things that used to be not charged, and now they're charged. I mean, it's become almost uh, commonplace for physicians to do this. And let me go to another question. This is from Jerry in Aurora, Colorado. He says, what effect will these advancements have on costs of various private medical plans and nationalized medical plans? Well, theoretically, it should lower the cost significantly, because if you keep people healthy, if 70% of the cost of American medicine is chronic disease, and we know we could cut down the uh, prevalence of chronic disease at least by a third, and we know that in the people we uh, are able to, uh, to, even the ones with the disease who are be be being able to be, be better managed, we're able to reduce the likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke uh, by another third, you're starting to look at 30, 40% reduction in the total cost of care delivery, not by skimping, but by better quality outcomes. And so, yeah, it should have a very salutary impact. Now, remember that for people who are in the industry, which is a very profitable industry, that's not necessarily right now a good thing, whether it's the drug companies or the hospitals or the ERs, the urgent care centers. I mean, they make their money when people get sick. So we're looking at a major transformation, a tremendous revolution in healthcare. That's going to mean we need a lot more outpatient facilities, a lot better lifestyle medicine uh, opportunities, and a lot fewer 
high-end hospitals, ERs, etc., as we keep people healthier and avoiding these problems that's sitting there. So I know that not everyone's going to embrace it. In fact, quite a number of people are going to resist it, not because it's the wrong thing to do, but simply because of the economic impact upon themselves. Yeah, what about that, though? I mean, physicians uh, have always sort of been drawn, many of them, to the fact that they can make a lot of money. And if the healthcare system changes in the ways you're talking about, in the ways you're envisioning, uh, that kind of incentive will not necessarily be there as strongly as it is now. Plus, when I keep thinking about all of the possibilities of generative AI healing and seeing to it that people don't die as easily as they do, I mean, medical mistakes, for example, cost thousands and thousands of deaths each year. We can cut through some of that, but then we run into population problems. I mean, I don't mean to put this in that perspective of uh, we have to think of numbers or anything quantitative like that, but it's a reality, just like the money is a reality. As a physician, I have trouble seeing uh, extension of good life as being a problem, and I don't think that very many of the listeners or uh, viewers would see it, see it that way as well. You know, we have a lot of data that really talks about the difference between length of life and length of good life. And right now, we prolong not good life. We wait till people become so sick that we can save their existence, but we can't necessarily save the quality of their life. Everything we're talking about here is preserving health. It's avoiding those kinds of problems. And so this is the good life that we need to be focused on uh, sitting there. Uh, in terms of the clinicians, you're absolutely right. There will be changes that are there, but right now it's gotten so out of control. 60% of physicians saying they are burned out. 71,000 doctors quitting the profession last year alone. Uh, what we have right now to the point that you're making is a, unfortunately, a chasm between primary care and specialists. Now, I'm a specialist. You know, my focus is on children with, with cleft lip and cleft palate doing reconstruction. But uh, right now, we have a lot of dollars going into specialty care and inpatient care we're talking about 60, 70% of the total dollars and very little into primary care. We're talking about five or 6%. That has to shift and this will create a shift that's there. And right now, I don't know how closely you follow it, we have a tremendous shortage, particularly of primary care in the United States. This is going to elevate that particular piece. It's gonna give those doctors more time. It's gonna give them the tools that they've been searching for to help their patients to be able to stay healthier, to avoid these types of diseases. It will raise income in the primary care aspect of the profession. And you're right, there will be a readjustment at the other end, but that's where the costs do need to be taken out of. Not today, because today the demand is there, but by lowering the demand, by which I mean keeping people healthier, avoiding the heart attacks, the strokes, the kidney failure, the systemic infections, all the problems that lead to but right now, as you say, more than half of Americans say they can't afford the health care that they uh, are signed up for today. They might have insurance, but if they get sick, they can't make the out-of-pocket payments. Lisa from San Francisco says, are there any negatives to talk about with AI and medicine? Um, I mean, we have been emphasizing the positive, but you mentioned bias before. That's a concern, a real concern, isn't it? So bias is a major concern in AI, and it's important for listeners to understand the difference, again, between what I mentioned earlier, this narrow AI versus the uh, generative AI. And the classic study was done by United Healthcare through their Optum division, and they basically said, who are our sickest patients? So that we can give them more resources and hopefully avoid their major complications. They had good motivation at the start of it. Yes, they would make money as a result of that, but it, is also aligned with what was the best interest of patients. And so they put a whole lot of information into a computer system and they came up with a list of individuals who should get this and about 15% of the individuals identified were black patients. When indiv individual researchers went back into the database, they found that it should have been 50%. Now, what was going on? Why did the computer system say 15% black patients rather than 50? Was this bias of the computer system? The answer is no. The reason was the computer system used dollars spent per year in healthcare as a indicator of severity of disease. That makes logical sense, except in the United States today, when you take a black patient and a white patient with identical clinical problems, we spend more money on the white patient. The bias is sitting in American medicine today. So will there be bias in all these systems? Yes. 
But why is it there? Because that's the way we practice today. Not intentionally, not because people are bad people. It's just the way that it happens in American medicine today. We could spend an entire program on that. But again, I'll point out the generative AI because it has multiple sources, including information on bias. I'm optimistic that it will do better. Is there anything that can really go wrong? Well, I think there's two things that can go wrong. I think the first thing is if we don't have integration of the patient, the clinician, and the application, then things can go wrong. I don't think you want to have the technology independent of clinicians. I'm talking about doctors, I'm talking about nurse practitioners, I'm talking about other individuals, physicians assistants providing direct care. That linkage is key. And if we don't have that, yeah, I can imagine patients getting into problems where they should have been avoided in the first place. But again, I'll go back to the point you've made. How many people are dying annually who shouldn't die? 400,000 for misdiagnosis, 250,000 for medical errors. And I'm going to say maybe close to a half a million from chronic diseases they either should never have had in the first place or should have had better managed without its complications. That's almost a million Americans dying every year. And to make, again, the point you made earlier, we don't notice it as humans, just like we don't notice the fact 45,000 people die in traffic accidents. When we, if someone's in an autonomous car and San Francisco's had its problems with that, I, I understand. Uh, one patient is a frontline page, uh, is a frontline news story or leading a banner headline in, in a um, social media uh, post, but, we don't notice that it's 45,000 people. In fact, when the University of Michigan did a study and they asked people, how many lives would have to be saved for you to become more comfortable? People said 35,000 out of the, 40, the 45,000. It would have to become 80% better before Americans would trust, the, uh, trust a, a machine, a computer over a human. We need to be able to do a less biased evaluation of technology, from my opinion, and when I look at that, it's hard for me not to say that a generative AI tool will not significantly improve medical outcomes, improve convenience of care, and lower costs for Americans. But you alluded to something earlier that really strikes me, and that is uh, we get the best of information from generative AI, but we get some of the worst, too. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation, and they can only depend to a great degree on what's out there and what's available in terms of data. And I'm struck by just the fact that I mean, a lot of people like you have been talking for years about the importance of empathy and the importance of purpose and loving medicine and doctors needing to be committed. And so you avoid burnout by making sure that they can stay committed and fill that sense of purpose. Empathy is a hard thing to associate with any kind of AI, I mean, or technology for that matter. It seems to obviate many people's minds against the idea of empathy. I love the question, Michael because it actually has been studied. So the University of Arizona did a study where they took uh, off of Reddit a bunch of questions coming from uh, patients about their health, and they gave the questions to, they looked at the answers that the patients had gotten back from clinicians, and they also gave it to the AI to write up responses. So now they have the actual human responses and they have the machine-generated responses. Then they mix these all up so there's no way to know which came from which, and they showed it to both uh, patients and to clinicians. The clinicians said that the answers given by the technology was actually significantly better than by the humans. But the big part was that the empathy factor, four times more empathy shown by the response or for the genera, generative AI technology than from the human. Four times higher. Now, we can not like the fact that <laughs> As far as we know, these machines are not sentient, and uh, it wasn't as though the application actually felt the pain. But is that what's most important, or do we as humans want it expressed? I mean, this is an existential question, again, we could debate at, at great length. But in terms of giving the empathy, you were not getting a rigid steel response. You were getting a very empathetic, uh, I'll say very human in a good sense, response. Uh, but you're getting it from a machine, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's the irony. Or that's the paradox, <laughs> the essence of it. Uh, I think in, well, you know, when we talk about medicine and it's not face-to-face -face and it's not eye contact and all of that sort of thing, I mean, telemedicine, you, you write about just the, the, the whole evolution of medicine. 
at Medicine 2.0, telemedicine was supposed to answer a lot of things. It didn't quite provide what it was supposed to provide. Now we're what? We're at 4.0? So this 4.0, I, I made these numbers, and these numbers exist in the academia. No one quite agrees where they are, but I try to find technological points. 1.0 was the introduction of CT, MRI, heart surgery, transplantation, the late 1900s, uh, major advances. 2.0 was the electronic health record, which should have had a big advance, as you noted earlier, but instead it was used mainly for financial purposes and it hasn't achieved that. 3.0 was the consumer-centric, you want to have an Expedia-like uh, opportunity to make appointments, to send email, to send text messaging, and it didn't happen. 4.0 is the introduction of generative AI, and we'll have to see whether it fulfills its promise or not. As I point out in the book, ChatGPT, MD, the two reasons why technology tends to fail is not the technology. It's the people using the technology, and a technology that either slows clinicians down or cuts into their income is not going to be utilized anywhere near its potential. And the opportunity with ChatGPT, with generative AI right now, is it can be used to give the doctor back time. Doctors spend on the average 17 minutes with a patient. How do you solve that? Well, if you keep people healthier and they have fewer patients, now they can spend more time. If the people who come into the office are the ones that need a human being, and I estimate in the book that 20% of what doctors do in the office today could be done by generative AI at home. It's not gonna replace your doctor completely. It's just gonna replace some of the things that take the doctor's time. So when you go into the office, you'll have more time. And instead of the clinician having to look at a computer screen, they can actually look at you because generative AI will provide the information to the clinician and other AI tools will also take care of the creation of the medical record. It's a much more human view uh, created by technology. I mean, if you look at farming, it's a great example. What the, what the tractor has done to create the opportunity for humans to have a very kind of different life than when they had to hold the land with their hands. This is the kind of technology we want to be talking about that actually enhances the doctor-patient relationship. It doesn't undermine it, it supports it, but it's different than just the idea of being the assistant to the clinician. We have to see that it has to empower the patient to be able to take an accountability for their own care and in taking that accountability to be able to achieve the better outcomes and the prevention of disease. Well, just cutting through the mountain of paperwork and what is required in the way of paperwork uh, is just extraordinary in terms of what generative AI can do and also uh, making this more patient-centric like you're assuming. I mean, that all is a part of uh, what seems is what we're headed for and that's that's all good. Uh, another question from Reed. Should some of our healthcare dollars go toward education regarding dietary choices and health club memberships, good investments? Well, Reed is absolutely right that I put that in the, in the bucket of lifestyle medicine, that we do a poor job there, whether you're talking about nutrition, whether we're talking about exercise, we're talking about um, staying flexible and strong, all these different ways that we know it will have a salutary impact. In fact, the literature is actually fascinating on this, uh, where if you take something like mild uh, anxiety and depression, uh, data says that exercise is as good as the medications we have now. And how many doctors prescribe med uh, exercise? Some of the reasons they don't do it is it's not in the medical model, but some of it also is that it just hasn't been easy for patients to do. How does a generative AI tool support a patient? Uh, Reed makes a great point about nutrition, food is medicine, and the opportunities that exist to be able to say, I'm, I have diabetes, here's my blood sugar, here's some other information coming off of a monitor that I've been wearing. I'd like a meal plan for the next seven days. I'd like to have a shopping list. I'd like to have a, a, a variety of ways that I can cook these, all these meals in under 30 minutes. The more parameters you give to it, the better it's going to do. ChatGPT can do that today. Well, one thing Chad GP2, excuse me, can't do is make patients follow doctor's prescriptions or doctor's orders or doctor's, uh, for that matter, imperatives. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a real correlation uh, of numbers that just don't fit in terms of following the doctor's orders. Well, this is a really important question. Is, is this a patient who doesn't care or is this a patient who needs more help in order to accomplish it? And I'm a big believer that it's actually the latter, not the former. I don't know anyone who doesn't want to be healthier. I think we just make it very hard. 
to figure out how to, it's a lot easier to stop at the McDonald's for dinner than to be able to get the ingredients, go home and cook it and prepare it for your particular family. And we have to also look at the cost that's sitting within all of it now. I actually believe that people with the support will do better. Now, if I'm all wrong and people are just not gonna wanna care about their health, not gonna wanna take care of themselves, I don't know what we're gonna do about this because we literally will have a total crisis as the uh, epidemic of chronic disease continues to accelerate and we have more and more people needing transplants and on dialysis and suffering heart attacks and filling up ERs. So I, you know, maybe I'm just offering the last possible hope for American medicine. Maybe it's not as optimistic as you say, it's just the reality of what exists today. And when I look at all the other possibilities, I don't see one that actually works. This is the only one where I can see it happening. You know, we've talked about this now for almost 100 years, 1932, the uh, Committee uh, for uh, Medical Cost Containment looked at this question, came up with the same recommendations. How do we restructure medicine to bring clinicians together in ways that they're able to cl collaborate and coordinate to form integrated medical groups? And then how do we reimburse them based upon the quality of the outcomes they achieve and their ability to prevent disease? That was almost 100 years ago. Why did it take so long? And by the way, along the way, every, uh, almost every president, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter, pushed this idea of value-based care. And I think the reason was we didn't have the tool to accomplish it. So what I would say, Michael, and I hope, I hope I'm right and that you're not right, that it's not the patient who's the problem. We just haven't had the tools to give to the patients. Now it's sitting here and it's very inexpensive. And I think that if clinicians started to help patients to use it, we'd have a lot more data and information around it. And I'm optimistic. I believe in the patient. I believe in the clinician too. But I believe that in humans want to do the right thing, we have to just facilitate it, make it easier to do, provide the so-called psychological nudges. And a key ingredient, we need visionary leadership like you provided. I mean, we need it across the nation, across the world, and we need it certainly in the White House as well, but that's another story. We got a question from Bo, and thank you for the question, Bo. He wants to know, how far are we from uploading our medical charts, blood work results, and connecting our smartwatches to an AI and have it suggest supplements or predict health issues? You're absolutely right. We're, I, think we're, I think we're moderately close. That's what these plugins are about. These are the tools that would connect devices and information. And by connect, I, although we're actually uh, OpenAI calls it GPTs, so because plugin actually sounds like you have a cord, you stick it in place. It's all done through Bluetooth and other means of, of communication. You're talking about a hospital at home almost, really, in some ways. Ah, reason. you're raising a really important point now, Michael, which is that the hospital, uh, from a lot of problems, needs to move from the inpatient setting to the home. And right now, it's too expensive. Right now, the only way we can use could analyze that data to figure out how someone's doing is by using humans. And it's just hard to have a human in a single home environment. But this generative AI tool can accomplish that. It can sort through the information. It can figure out the 80, 85, 90, 95% of people who are doing just fine. And again, based upon the clinician's input as to what the out outcome is expected to be, and then the other five or 10% can be connected with telemedicine to human beings, 24 by seven to provide the care, not to the individual doctor, that individual he or she can't do it themselves, but through a, you know, a telemedicine hub line uh, with clinicians for emergency medicine and from primary care, able to evaluate the information, figure out exactly what's going on. And again, I wanna keep pointing out for listeners, this is not inferior care, this is superior care. Because today when those things happen, we either don't know it or it's impossible to get help and people say, go to an ER. No, you want immediate intervention to evaluate how you're doing and then you want to have the ambulance come, the ER ready to receive you and be able to treat the problem if that's what it is or be able to tell you, no, it looks like it's fine. We'll continue to follow it for the rest of the night. We, we have um, certain things that are very cutting edge in the United States in healthcare but a lot of what we have is left over from the last century. Although actually when it comes to technology, it's left over from the century before. The most common way that clinicians today exchange information is the fax machine and 1834 invention. Well, generative AI will bring different disciplines together in a way that we hadn't even conceived or imagined. And that's really on the hopeful side too. What are the markers that were on our way toward the kind of thing that you're envisioning here in your book and that we've been talking about all along? When will we know for example, if we're moving in the right direction and definitely on course. There are 
two as a, once again there are two parts to that there's the technology part and the human part on the technology part we'll have to just follow the evolution um the word on the street is that chat gpt5 will be coming soon or gpt5 will be coming soon and the memory be just keeps increasing better <laughs> as we, exactly as we're speaking exactly. in fact probably yeah and, and that's again what has me so encouraged about this technology if you look at a narrow ai application if you put in 10,000 mammograms, it can help you diagnose breast cancer, uh, but it can't tell you anything about pneumonia or brain uh, cancer. So you have to put in uh, thousands and thousands of thousands set of data. Generative AI is different. You're basically able to load all of the information available on the internet, all of it available through social media, through other tools. And so it's only gonna be a question of really money. Do, the, do these organizations have the money to input that much do they have the money and the chip manufacturing capability to develop the technology but it's um i'll call it both a, a big number and a small number let me come back to that in a second if that's okay but there's also the human piece and you mentioned it earlier will there be the visionary leadership to do it will clinicians be willing to leave what today is an uncomfortable but uh manageable kind of practice and be able to embrace a uh, reimbursement system that rewards them based upon the quality and the outcome, the excellence of the work that they do. Are they willing to be able to take the risk involved in that particular process? That that th Those are not easy things uh, to do. But uh, in terms of the technology, I think that um, we can just watch it develop across time. Um, the I'll say the price tag put on it by Sam Altman, who's the head of OpenAI, is seven trillion six to seven trillion dollars now i'm not sure that he really means that number sometimes you put a big number out there so that you can get the four to five you really want but it's still going to be in the trillions now one way to say is my gosh that's impossible five trillion dollars a year the the projection is that by the year 2031 american healthcare will cost three trillion dollars more a year every year Three trillion dollars that could be used to lower the cost of healthcare, invest in education, invest in transportation, all the ways that it could be used. And we don't even blink at three trillion dollars more a year for healthcare. And yet that price tag for the basically to create the chips that are necessary to run the application it's uh, not makes sustainable. it say, uh, impossible. It's yeah, really yeah. not sustainable. It, it takes yeah, it will take two years of healthcare costs to repay that entire debt. And then for the next 10 years, it will reduce the cost by $30 trillion. The mind boggles. I mean, particularly in light of the federal deficit, when you think about those kind of dollars. Uh, I mean, but well, you're talking also about a major shift here. You, you Speaking really or alluding to a cultural shift, instead of being reactive, we have to be proactive. I mean, you've been saying that to some extent your whole career. I've been saying that whenever I talk about what we're talking about, which is progress and moving in a different direction and, and, and really achieving uh, change in the real sense of what progressive change means. I don't mean progressive in any political sense. I just mean progressing and moving forward. So the technological is moving and it's moving in ways that we can't even uh, determine, as you've indicated, just so fast and so exponentially. But it's the human that we have to worry about. There's always been a cultural lag when it comes to the human versus the machinery and the technology that human beings create. And that lag is going to continue. And I don't know how we can measure that. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, that, that's why I write the books. Uh, that's why you write the, all the stuff that you write and you host your brilliant, pro, uh, I'll call them podcast radio for so, so many years, uh, to be able to educate people uh, around these pieces that are there. Well, we're both uh, educators, but we're educating maybe the people that... Uh, don't necessarily need to be educated a lot of the time. I mean, how do we reach those people who, I don't know, I, I hesitate to describe them in any generic way, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, so- People who aren't, uh, aren't listening or don't want to listen and don't care or apathetic, you know? Well, well, the first thing I would say is that anyone who is listening or watching, um, post it on social media. Tell them about ChatGPT coming out April the 9th. Be able to communicate around the opportunities that exist. Um, Every change movement requires about 25% of people to make it happen. And all it says to me, if it hasn't happened yet, one reason is it hasn't reached enough people. So we got to reach more people. But I'm going to add another piece to it, Michael. And you've known me for a long time. And for both in Mistreated and Uncaring, my first two books, I talked about what should be. 
And I looked, as you said, and I've nothing much changed. And I've said to myself, you know, change doesn't happen because it should happen. I mean, that's what should happen, but it, that's not why it happens. I think it happens because circumstances, context change that now makes it possible to happen. And you've pointed out very well two things. One is that the finances have now become truly unsustainable. Uh, we just can't spend three trillion more dollars every single year on healthcare for the same, I'll say, lagging quality outcomes amongst the 12 most industrialized nations. We're last in life expectancy, last in maternal mortality, worst in childhood mortality. Go down a long list of uh, ways in which the outcomes that we get lag everyone else despite spending more than twice as much as almost every other wealthy country to say nothing about 50 times, 100 times more than countries like the Philippines and India. So that's one aspect uh, that's there. Uh, and the second part is that we now have the tool. And that to me is why I wrote ChatGPT. It's why I worked with ChatGPT as a co-author to get it out fast. That's what people have to realize is the power of this tool to be able to accomplish the things that otherwise were impossible. We mentioned earlier, 100 years since this committee, CC, uh, CMCC, uh, came up with this recommendation. Why did it take so long? I've come to conclude we didn't have the ability to do it. And you can see a problem. I need to get a rock up a hill, but unless you have a machine able to help you, you can want it, think, think it has to happen. But once that machine is there, you still have to use that machine. And that's where I believe that we are today in American medicine. We have this tool, not what's here today. What's here today is the toy but what will be here in three to five years. And we have the imperative, I believe, to make the changes. And as you pointed out, we need the visionary leadership and we need the courage to be able to make it happen. And I'm convinced that if we do all of that, both as doctors and patients, that we have a shot. We have a chance of being able to save American medicine because the alternative is not very good. But the fact that there's a bad alternative, my observation is that doesn't always drive the right thing to happen. You also write about something that is inexplicably part of this whole equation, and that is a love of medicine. I mean, those who practice, the clinicians and so forth, really need to have not only purpose and dedication, but they, I think, ideally need to love what they do and love helping people. Let me go to a question from James in Cleveland, my hometown. James says, is the real value of chat GPT infinite customization? Right now, much of medicine is focused on putting people into treatment boxes and providing generalized care? Absolutely. Uh, th these questions from your listeners and viewers is tremendous. That's exactly what a generative AI tool can do. The more information you put into it, the better answers you're going to get. I mean, take something like the human genome. It's unimaginably large. There's no human being whose brain can comprehend all of the information available on that. And so it doesn't play a big role. We still ask, you know, what's your family history as part of the medical examination. But how many of us include a full set of genomic information in our analyses to be able to personalize the care. It's exactly the opportunity because despite all of the base pairs and the DNA of the human being, it's again, a, a, a minuscule problem for a generative AI application to include all of it in its analysis. If it can include all of the internet, if it include all my 1.2 million words, it can certainly include everyone's genomics. It's med that your medical history, your medications, your age, your family, whatever data, the more data you provide, the better. But and it also includes, forgive me, sure. intuition and a kind of clairvoyance sometimes almost. I mean, before we uh, started, I brought up something. I always like to talk about timely things. I brought up this transplant, a kidney transplant of a pig into a human being. And I thought, great, you know, people are going to get, they're not going to wait in line long periods of time to get a kidney now. Uh, they're going to have to uh, not necessarily go on dialysis for long periods of time and so forth and so on. And you, as a long practicing physician, as someone who has some of these intuitive powers, said basically, hold on a minute, Mike, there's a lot to be cautious of here. I mean, in terms of the hyping and the over imagining of what the results might be. I mean, we have to go clear, we have to clarify those things. And it's intuitive powers and experience that allow for that clarification, right? I think the opposite. I think it's scientific knowledge. I mean, I read the literature all the oh, time. Oh, no, I include scientific knowledge in that, absolutely. Uh, but you need a sense of intuitiveness, too. You need to draw from the scientific knowledge and be able to project from that. I mean, you're projecting into the future, aren't you, really, in this book? Well, you have to be able to connect pieces. Um, and that's, you know, on my podcast, I've talked about uh, 
the same kind of technology on heart transplants that have been done both in, uh, on, well, these have been on patients who've been end of life, uh, they've already died, they had a brain death and they needed to have their heart replaced and they were able to accomplish it. And I looked at the data and said they did really well for a couple of weeks and then they ended up having a rejection. So I, I caution that that could happen only right now, two days past the transplant. So the, that, that cycle hasn't happened. No, I think that's a scientific analysis and that's exactly what generative AI can do. I, and that I think is the problem. I, I think even clinicians, you know, um, we both know very well the work of Kahneman on cognitive biases and the way we have, um, we overvalue things that happened recently. We overvalue loss over gain. It's a lot of different ways that our brain misleads us. And that I think the computer will avoid. Uh, no one should get me wrong. This is not the easy panacea answer. That's not gonna solve it. We now though have a tool that didn't exist that is now so powerful. And now, as you point out, it's gonna be up to humans to apply it in ways that achieve the outcomes that we want. And when we can align the organization, the structure of medicine with the technology and with the reimbursement system, now we have the fertile soil to grow and to transform and grow an American healthcare uh, system of outcomes that are gonna be dramatically better than today. And I think can rescue what otherwise will be a car accident about to happen. Well, in those encouraging words, uh, let me extend my thanks, first of all, to all of you who have joined us for this live episode of Gray Matter with Michael Krasny and ditto to all who will be listening on Apple, Spotify, or on our website at graymatter.show. And if you aren't yet a member of this podcast, I invite and urge you to join simply by going to our website at graymatter.show, where you can find any of our previous episodes. Uh, Dr. Pro was talking, for example, about mammograms and all the data with mammograms. And Dr. Laura Esserman is one of those previous episodes. And we have a lot of distinguished medical people through the number of episodes that we've done. That's great with an E, by the way. Also invite you to email any questions, responses, or reactions that you may have to me at mkrasny at graymatter.show, K-R-A-S-N-Y. And my thanks to the Gray Matter with Michael Krasny team, Alex, Shannon, Chad, Jeff, Kevin, Colin, and Colleen. And a special thanks to this week's special guest, Dr. Robert Pearl. Thank you, Michael. And anyone who wants more information, the website's robertpearlmd.com. And there's a lot of uh, material there on generative AI and I welcome feedback from anyone who obtains the book and reads the book, both their positive words, but also their disagreements and criticism. It's all going to be a learning process. And together we can make American healthcare once again, the best in the world. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, thank you for being here. And I'll put a plug in for your medical newsletter as well. And uh, final plug for intuition as well as science. They should go together. <laughs> I'm Michael Krasny. Bandwidth for Gray Matter is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com.